right, thank you. Uh, so I'm Curtis, I'm a postdoc at Waterloo, and I did some work with MapleSoft over the past uh, two years on the SAT solver in, in Maple. So I'll be talking about that today. Uh, so this was a really fun paper to write. It was a really fun project to do because we got to solve a lot of fun applications, some puzzles, some practical applications. And the idea is we're going to solve them using a SAT solver, which when I started working in SAT a couple of years ago, this was totally mind-boggling. You know, it was like, why on earth would you want to do that? Right? We have problems that have nothing to do with SAT. Why do we care about using a SAT solver? Right? This can't be a good thing to do. The idea why it actually is useful is kind of encapsulated in this quote here from Chris Jefferson. And I've had this experience myself where I'm tasked with a problem and I come up with a clever algorithm to solve it. I implement the algorithm, fix the bugs, everything. It runs pretty nicely. And then at the end, I type, OK, why not try translating to, tr to SAT? You know, and I, you can code it up. Uh, and oftentimes, it actually performs better than the cleverer approach. Right? This general purpose approach actually beats out the special purpose approach, which is kind of paradoxical. But the reason why is that SAT solvers have, there's a lot of engineering effort that's gone into them to make them really fast for certain types of problems. So my task is basically to introduce you to the SAT solver in Maple and kind of show you how you can solve certain types of problems using a SAT solver that you might not otherwise think to use. All right, so let me introduce SAT. SAT is short for the Boolean Satisfiability Problem. So this is a classic problem in computer science and logic. You're given a logical expression, so the variables are either true or false, and they're combined with logical operators. The question is, can you find an assignment to the variables which makes the formula true? So Maple has uh, a great functionality for working with Boolean logic. So if you lo load up the logic package here, you get the commands which are in the logic package. So the ones at the front, the ones that start with an ampersand, are the logical connectives. So the most straightforward thing you can do is just take, OK, two variables x and y and run, we connect them with the logical operator and, and so you get x and y. So if you're not familiar with logical notation, the caret sign there denotes an and. So what this expression is saying is that x has to be true and y has to be true. Right? And then you can make more complicated expressions using other logical operators. So here's a, a function, or uh, a formula f, and it says not x implies y or z. Right? So the not is this little line with a hook, the implies is an arrow, an or is an upside down caret. Right? So what this is saying is that if x is false, then either y is true or z is true. Right? So you can combine logical operators in arbitrary complex ways to make very large formulas. Right? And the reason why we're going to care about this is because Maple has this great function, satisfy. So basically, every application in this talk, all I'm going to do is set up my logical expressions and then call satisfy. So what, what happens when you do that? you get Maple will return a satisfying assignment of the formula if one exists. Right? So not all formulas have a satisfying assignments. If they don't, they're called unsatisfiable, and Maple will return a null result. Otherwise, it'll give you an explicit satisfying assignment. So here we can take x to be false, y to be true, z to be false, and we satisfy f. Right? And so this, the SAT solver in Maple is very effective on certain types of problems. Right? So in general, we don't have any provably efficient way to solve SAT. But surprisingly, we can solve problems with millions of variables. But right? Just one solution. This is just one solution, yes. It will, it will return uh, it, it, a solution at random, sort of. <coughs> right? Can you just return all? Uh, you, you would have to block one solution, return the Yeah. So there, it's, uh, it's not provably efficient. But it'll return very fast in cases where you, you know, brute force search would not cut it. Right? You have to do something clever. So I'm going to talk about a lot of different problems in the, in the talk. And if you're interested in any of the nitty gritty details in them, you can download the code from the Maple Application Center. Everything is online. So I'm just going to go over some of them here. So here's a fun one. This is from chess. There's this, there's this problem where you have a chess board. It can be n by n, or focus, we'll focus on the 8 by 8 case. We're trying to put eight queens on the board so that no two queens on the board are attack each other. So this is a, uh, it's a hard problem when you're trying to actually do it by hand, right? Because you put one queen down, you can put a second queen down pretty easily, you can put a third queen down, and then by the time you get to five, six, seven, eight, 
you're, there's very few places and you're kind of like, it's like whack-a-mole. You put one down, you have to take one off. Because queens, they attack in a lot of directions, right? They attack any column, any row, or any diagonal. So if that, you put the queen there, you can't put any other queen in any of the dots. So somehow we have to fit eight queens on the board. All right, so how, you know, how would you go about doing this? You could write your own search algorithm to do it. We're going to do it with sat. And so to do that, when you're programming in sat, remember the, the hard thing is every variable has to be either true or false. Right? So to represent this problem in a sat context, you know, note that there's either a queen on a square or there's not a queen on the square. Right? So we can have a variable for every square on the board representing if there's a queen in that square. Right? So the variables here, we'll call them qxy, where xy is the coordinate of the board. Right? So we're going to have 64 variables. And I, you, know, you can write a, a simple maple function just to generate them, just to show you what they look like. There's uh, q11 to q88. Now, those are the variables. Now we have to tell the SAT solver what are the constraints of the problem. Right? What are the rules of the game? So there's two types of constraints for this problem. First, we have to tell the SAT solver there has to be at least uh, eight queens on the board. Right? So to, the way you can do that is note that there has to be a queen in every row and every column. Because right? we're trying to fit eight queens on an eight by eight board. You put one queen in a row. You can put at most queen, one queen in every row. So there has to be one queen in each row to get eight on the board. To do that, you have a constraint like this. This is saying at least one of these variables must be true. So this is saying basically that the rare, there's a queen in the first column. Right? So you generate constraints like this for every row and every column. I'm just showing you one, not to overwhelm the screen with uh, formulas. The second type of constraints is the, the blocking constraints. Right? If you put a queen down, any, any square attacked by that queen can, can't also contain a queen. So these are the negative constraints. Right? And here they look like this. If there's a queen on the 1-1 one, one square, then every other square that is attacked by the 1-1 one, one queen, which are these ones, can't be true. Right? So this, if this is true, all of these variables have to be false. All right? So you generate a constraint like this for every square on the board. I know I'm just showing you one, but the, the rest of them are being generated behind the scenes. And then that's it. We just, you can write a simple maple code to generate those functions, uh, those expressions very easily. And then we just call satisfy and see what happens. We, t we want both of the constraints to be two, so we take the logical and of both of those constraints. And here is the satisfying assignment. It's re returned basically immediately. OK, it looks, looks, looks like a mess of trues and falses, right? So I wrote simple code to plot the solution, right? So whenever there's a true variable, you put a queen there. And so this is 8 by 8. You can visually see it immediately that it, it satisfies the constraint. So let's try something larger. We do a 16 by 16 board. right? My functions take n as a parameter. They generate the constraints. They call satisfy. And you get the 16 by 16 solution. right? So this is an effective way of solving this problem. Very little programming involved. right? And, it, and it's, it's actually quite efficient. It would probably be faster than what you would do by hand unless you spend a lot of time tuning it, right? So another uh, fun application here is the Einstein riddle. If, uh, who's heard of this? OK, so no one's here. It's done it. So it, actually, Einstein had nothing to do with this riddle. <laughs> it was uh, whoever named it that you know, wanted to say you had to be a genius to solve it, right? So they said, OK, Einstein devised this to, to uh, weed out the geniuses. All right, so the idea, the idea is you have five houses in a row. And each house has a different attributes. They can be a, each house is, has a different color. Each house has a different pet living in it. Each house is owned by a different person of a different nationality. So there's 25 different attributes, and none of the attributes are shared amongst the houses. Right? And then we have 15 given facts. So this is it's just a basic logic fa uh, puzzle. And then the puzzle here is, who owns the fish? So the fish lives in one of the houses. Who owns it? Right, so there's, uh, there's one way to satisfy all these constraints. And we can solve this very simply in Maple using the SAT solver. So we're going to have, in this case, we have the variables S, I, A. I is the index of a house from 1 to 5. A is an attribute, one of the 25 possible attributes of the, of the problem. And then to show you what the variables look like, we have, this is the set of variables that we're going to be giving to the SAT solver. 
So what is the encoding? So I'll, I'll just go over the encoding quickly here. First of all, each attribute appears at least once. So if, say you look at the color blue. One house has to be colored blue. So we don't know which one it is, it's one to five. However, if the first house is colored blue, the second house is not colored blue because no, no attributes are duplicated. And if you look at just the first house, it has to be colored something, right? So either blue, green, red, white, or yellow. And if it's colored blue, it's not colored green, right? We have no multicolored houses here. So one color each, and then the known facts, these are just translated directly from the problem. So they're given, these are the facts that are given to you. You pass those to the SAT solver as well. And then, again, we're just going to say all the things that we just generated must be true and pass those to satisfy. And again, immediately returns the result. This is, and of course it's a mess, so I wrote code which will parse the satisfying assignment. It iterates through it and gives you back, here's a nice uh, five by five grid telling you the, the attributes of each house. Right, so the fish here is owned by the German in the fourth house. Right, so nice, easy solution. So I'll talk about a uh, more mathematical type of problem now. So who here, who here knows what a Latin square is? All right, so a number. So a Latin square studied in combinatorics. Uh, we have an n by n matrix, and there's going to be n distinct entries. Among, each entry is one of n things, and no, there's no duplicates in any row or column. All right, so this is an example of a 4 by 4 uh, Latin square. And you know you can visually it's easy to check, right? So the Greco Latin square we're, is we're going to have two Latin squares. One is with Latin letters. One is with Greek letters. We're going to superimpose the Latin squares one over the other, right? So it looks something like this. They're both Latin squares, so that you have the uh, no duplicates in each row or column. Also, when you do the superposition, you get all possible pairings. Right, so every possible of the 16 possible ways of pairing Latin with Greek, so A with alpha, A with delta, A with beta, A with gamma, they all appear in here. All right, so this is a 4 by 4 Greco Latin square. So they have an interesting history. They were studied by Euler in 1782, and he basically was able to construct infinite classes of these. He constructed them whenever n was odd or of a multiple of 4. Or, uh, at when, yeah, when m was uh, multiple of 4 or odd. So he couldn't construct them in the, in the remaining cases, which was when n was of the form 4k plus 2. Right? He tried, it, he tried for a while. The conjecture became famous because he couldn't resolve it in his lifetime. And he actually conjectured, OK, they probably don't exist. Right? He spent a lot of time looking at these things. So the conjecture was, show, the, so it was actually, it was open for his entire life, over 100 years after his life. Finally in 1900, the conjecture was shown in order six, the smallest open case. Three, for three independent and valid proofs were generated in the early 20th century. So they were published, and then there was a bombshell result in 1960 where they were actually generated in every order larger than six. There's only two orders they don't exist, that's two and six. Right? So Euler was, his conjecture was wrong, and so basically we can verify this in Maple. Right? We can actually generate uh, small Grego Latin squares just using a SAT encoding. So the way we do this, we're going to let the first Latin square be x, second Latin square be y, and then we're going to say, we have to use three indices here, x, i, j, k, it will be true exactly when the i, j th entry is k. Right? So the, the set for 4 by 4 Latin squares, Latin Greco squares look like this. Every possible uh, coordinate, every possible entry, and then x and y. There will be 2 times 4 cubed, because we have x and y. So 64 would represent one Latin square. So 
the SAT encoding again, they're starting to look pretty similar. You, these things come up a lot. Okay, so you take one entry in the first Latin square. It has to be A, B, C, or D. If it's A, it can't be B. And if the first, if one one entry is A, then the entry beside it, one two, can't be A because of the distinctness constraint. There's no duplicates. And then the ortho, the superposition constraint. It's a bit trickier. So you take, say, A and alpha. It has to exist somewhere in that superposition. Either it'll be in the one one, which would be here. It'll either it'd be one two, one three, one four. You just try all possible, all sixteen possibilities. So this is saying A alpha appears somewhere in that superposition. You do that for every possible pair. And then the last one is actually not strictly necessary. This is information you can give the SAT solver. So whenever you can give the SAT solver more information, you can assign certain variables to be true straight off the bat. It's good to do that because the SAT, you're giving the SAT solver extra information. In this case, Latin squares have a lot of symmetries, right? You can permute any of the rows. You can permute any of the columns. You can assume without loss of generality that the first row and column are always in increasing order if you represent them by integers, right? And then by renaming entries, you can do the same thing in the, the first row is going to be increasing in the second Latin square. So we can just assume without loss of generality, we can give the first row and first column of the first Latin square and the first row of the second Latin square. So again, these constraints are not too bad. We can just, I'm just going to pass them to satisfy and then I'm going to time them and see how long it takes for the first uh, seven squares. So we got to seven in like two seconds. I skipped six because they don't exist in six. Maple can show that in about 15 seconds. Uh, and so you can see I used colors to, to show the, the uh, Latin Greco squares, right? So this, this entries of the second Latin square are superimposed, so there's the smaller squares. All right, and then you can verify there's going to be a, a red with a yellow and a yellow with a red, and so on. And then so I ran this for order 10. And so this one finishes in about a day. And so this is the counterexample to Euler's conjecture, right? This is what Euler couldn't construct, right? So uh, you know, if Euler had a copy of Maple, this wouldn't be in the conjecture, right? So OK, so people have probably seen Sudoku, right? So Sudoku is a special type of Latin square. So when you complete a Sudoku grid, all the entries in the first row have to be distinct. All the entries in the column have to be distinct. But then you also have a, a, another distinction in the crane is that the three by three subgrids here, the white ones and the gray ones highlighted, also have to be distinct. So uh, similarly, you can give the sets over that, uh, that constraint. So what we, what we wanted to do is find a, so we can solve Sudoku problems, no problem. What we wanted to do was generate them automatically. Right, so to do this, I'm just, we can just pass Maple the uh, distinctness constraints and what I'm going to do here is we want to generate a random, uh, a random puzzle, right? So if you get, give the sat solver a set of constraints, it'll always return back the same uh, this satisfying assignment that you get. Even if there's multiple, it'll give you the same one. Unless there is a solver options command here. You can check the documentation. You can pass a random seed to the sat solver. So whenever it has to make a random choice, it'll choose something differently. And then so that, that allows you to, when there's multiple solutions, you can generate a random one. Right, so here I just generated a random completed Sudoku grid. Of course, we want to generate puzzles, so what you can do is just throw entries away. So I have a parameter here to say how many entries I want to throw away. And then here we go. So this is a Sudoku puzzle. It definitely has a solution because that was how I generated it. However, it's not a valid Sudoku puzzle because it has more than one solution. Right, so the Sudoku puzzles that you find in the newspaper, they'll have exactly one solution. Right? So how do we verify this, well, we can actually just have the SAT solver look for a different solution, right? So it solves this. It finds another solution. So it has more than one solution, so it's no good. What you can do then is, OK, throw away less, fewer entries and get back something. So in this case, we get a valid Sudoku puzzle, right? And then you can toy with that number, right? You can try to make it so you're not throwing away as many as you know, extra entries. And we did this. We implemented a Sudoku in Maple. So you can find this on the application center You know, if you want to waste some time <laughs> uh, when you're working in Maple. Uh, so just to show you how it works, so I mean, this entry here can't be a, a 1 because there's a 1 here. These two entries can't be a 1 because there's a 1 here. 
So this entry in the, would have to be a one, right? And so if you think you're, uh, you took a guess, you want to check. So the check just calls the SAT solver with the, with the board. And so if I entered the incorrect answer, this, you know, just make another call to the SAT solver, there's no solution, right? And then of course, we can solve the puzzle. And then like I just said, we can generate random ones on the fly, right? So, and then, you know, some extra functionality for, for loading it. In any case, so, so that was like a f kind of a fun application, right? So we're, now we're moving into maybe quote more serious application. So the graph theory uh, package, you know, Maple already has this. There's this graph theory problem. Maple has this functionality already. There's a chromatic number that you can use to commute the chromatic number of a graph. You want to find the minimum number of colors necessary to color a graph such that any two adjacent vertices are not colored the same thing. All right, so here's a, co a coloring, a three coloring of the Peterson graph. But the question is, okay, can we do this using SAT, right? We have the approach in Maple already, but let's see how the SAT approach compares, right? So the encoding here is gonna be for every vertex and every color, we have a variable, right? So the ver variables will be x, i, j, where i is a color and j is a vertex. Right, so the encoding is pretty straightforward. Uh, every vertex has to be assigned a color, so if we're trying to find a three coloring, first vertex has to be red, green, or blue. No vertices have been assigned two colors, so in particular the first vertices can't be assigned both red and blue at the same time. And then the coloring constraint that if you have the two vertices are adjacent, they can't be colored the same way. Right, so that's, that's the encoding. And so we can generate a graph. So I found a graph online. Uh, so it was just, a, it was a random, I, it was on, in a paper somewhere. It was in a bench, collection of benchmarks. So I generate the graph. So it's 125 vertices. I try to find a color, a one coloring. It doesn't exist. Try to find a two coloring. Try to find a three coloring. Then find, okay, at five, we find one. And this took about uh, eight, eight, nine seconds, right, to find this uh, five coloring of this graph with 125 vertices. This can be optimized a lot. So actually, the most of the time here was actually just generating the constraints. That's how good SAT solvers are. Uh, it took almost all that time was generating the constraints. So if you optimize the generation of the constraints, we did this, we put it into Maple. And if you call, in the latest version of Maple, if you call the chromatic number function, there's this method parameter where you can control the method used. So if you have method equals SAT, it will use basically this exact same encoding, but optimized to generate the constraints efficiently. And it runs in a quarter of a second here, right? So, and then the, the punchline is really, if you try to run this in the previous version of Maple, I, I, it didn't finish after an hour, right? So somehow the SAT approach is just way more effective on, this was, it was a pretty dramatic, uh, you know, I tried a, a lot of benchmarks and the SAT approach was actually performing better in almost all of them, all right? And sometimes dramatically better. So, uh, so, we, so we added that into the chromatic number function. And then th we also did the maximum clique problem. So maximum clique is also a graph theory problem. So a clique is a, a subset of a graph where all the vertices are connected. This is a graph where we have a four clique, the highlighted vertices here, they're all mutually connected. And we want to find, given a graph, find the maximum clique, the largest clique in the graph. Uh, this, again, Maple has a command to already do this, but I was looking for ways to, to do it in SAT, see if it could be, we can improve it. All right, so the encoding here, we're gonna have a variable for every vertex in the graph, which denotes, is that variable gonna be in the clique or not? All right, say we're trying to find a clique of size K, right, to make this a, a yes, no problem. So the first constraint is pretty straightforward. If you have two vertices which are not connected, they can't both be true, right? That would violate the clique constraint. The clique says if you have two vertices which are true, then they're in the clique, so they must be connected, All right? So you just generate for every uh, edge which is not in the graph, you generate a constraint like this. But then that will give us a clique, but you could just take no variables to be true. Right, that would be a zero clique. So we want to enforce that we find a K clique, 
right? At least k of the variables are true. So to do this is a little bit tricky. Uh, the first way, thing you might uh, try is to do some encoding like this, where we say, OK, we want at least k of the variables to be true. Let's say, OK, either the first k variables are true, or we try all possible ways of choosing k uh, variables out of n. n choose k, that's exponential. Uh, there's an exponential number of things I left off here. So this approach doesn't work. There's too many constraints you're giving to the SAT solver. There is a cleverer way to do it, which I will go over just to introduce it to you. It's kind of it's well known in the SAT world. So to do this, the idea is we're going to use extra variables that aren't strictly part of the problem, but you actually have extra power when you can just you can just define variables as you want. We're going to let a variable s k n denote there is at least k variables of the n that are true. Right? The reason why this gives us extra power is because we have a nice inductive definition for this. Because when is skn true? It's a true exactly when either k of the first n minus 1 are true, or when k minus 1 of the first n minus 1 are true and xn is true. Right? So this is a nice way to define skn in terms of sk n minus 1 and sk minus 1 n minus 1. All right, so it gives you a nice inductive definition for SKN. So it's a, it's a kind of a sleight of hand way of doing it, but it works. And just to sh show you what they look like. So for N equals 5, K equals 3, the constraints look like this. It's a definition of S53. And this is fairly efficient, you know, much more efficient than the exponential encoding. So this allows us to say at least K vertices are going to be in the clique. So let's try it. I, so in this case, we're going to start k at 1, try to find a 1 clique. That's pretty trivial. Keep increasing k until, oh, we went off the screen. And so you increase k until 17. There's no clique of size 17, so we found the maximum one at 16. Right? Again, this was a, from an implementation challenge on the web. Uh, the graph had 45 vertices, and so a 16 clique. So it took about five seconds. Again, this can be off the encoding can be improved, you know, to tail it to tune it. So latest version of Maple has this also in the maximum clique function. We have a method equals sat parameter. So we call method equals sat on the same graph. So I loaded it again, so there's no caching. And then uh, it finishes in 0.16 seconds. So the previous version of Maple took about three or four minutes to solve that one. So there's the timings in the paper for a number of benchmarks. It's not always faster. Uh, I think it was, it was faster in the majority of cases, the SAT approach. And it, but when it was faster, it was often significantly faster. So it, you know, th this is not only uh, applicable to these puzzles, but it's also applicable to, you know, quote, real world uh, important problems. All right. The last one I want to talk about briefly just to show you, I wanted something which was a kind of a stretch application, something which is more difficult to encode. Uh, so the 15 puzzle, so maybe some of you have played this. I think it was popular in like the 1880s or something when it was developed. You know, this was like this, you know, now everybody, this was a smartphone of the day, right? People were on their 15 puzzles. The idea is you have a, f a four by four grid. The tiles are labeled one to 15 and you have a blank, a blank tile. The only moves you're allowed to make in the, on the board is to slide a tile into the blank tile. You can swap a tile with a blank tile if it's adjacent to it. Uh, and then the, the problem is basically just sort the tiles in an increasing order and with the blank tile in the bottom right. All right, so this, this encoding was more difficult because the board is constantly changing, right? So I had to add a time parameter to the encoding. And so you have the state of the board at each time. And then we, try, we eventually will finish with this, the, the finished product. So the variables are s, i, j, n, t, where s, that will be true exactly when the i, j square contains tile n at time t. All right, so the encoding is more complicated, but I'll just go over it just to give you a flavor of what the constraints look like. And if you're interested, the, it's online. So first of all, you, sta you state the, uh, the beginning of the, the problem. You're given what looks here as, as a problem. So we say, OK, at time t, at time t equals 0, you have the, the state of the board. You give that to the SAT solver. All right, this is a bunch of uh, what are known as unit clauses. 
And then we also know the board has to be finished. We don't know what, how, how long it's going to take. It'll be at some time t. This says the board is finished. The, the, you have the board in sorted order, ending with the blank tile in the bottom right. And then an easy constraint you have is two tiles can't occupy the same square at the same time. This is part of the physicality of the problem. All right, so for example, tiles one and two can't be in the same location at the beginning time, time zero. Then the tricky part, how do you encode, go to, from time step t to time step t plus one? So I'll just show you what it looks like. The, the easy one to note is that if you have something which is not adjacent to the blank tile, then it can't, uh, then it can't move, right? It's not, it's not gonna change from time t to time t plus one. To encode that in set, it looks like this. I had to build up a couple, couple like auxiliary functions to, to do it, but in any case, this is what it looks like. Then the trickier one is that if, it, if the tile is the blank tile, one tile from beside it is going to swap with it at time t, right? So it looks like this. I had to define this one tile move function which will turn the constraints which specify that that one tile moves at that time. And so if you have the blank tile, you have one tile moving into that blank tile. All right, so that's the constraints. They're messy, but this is the the advantage of using SAT is that you don't have to worry about now doing the search algorithm, right? You just give the SAT solver the constraints. It's often a lot easier to declare the, you know, declare the constraints of the problem than it is to write a search algorithm. So we're going to run SAT. This will take a little bit of time. I start at five moves. It doesn't find one with five moves. Now it's looking for one with 10 moves. It doesn't find one. It's looking for one with 15 moves. So I'm using 31,000 constraints and 4,000 variables here. So, and it, so it's looking, and it finds one in about 10 seconds. And then, so this is a really cool maple command, the explore command, which allows you to do animations. So this is, to visualize it, I make an animation of the, of the game, and I'll play it for you here. <laughs> so you can see it, and there's a slider, right, so you can Go through the. So that's what makes it allows you to do, right? So that, unfortunately, this is not a necessarily a practical way of solving this problem. The encoding is pretty convoluted, but you know I didn't have to use any search algorithm. All right. So in conclusion, set solvers are surprisingly useful, right? They, they really, when they work, they work very well. There's a lot of engineering effort that's gone into them, right? So for the two uh, graph theory commands, they actually, they're in Maple currently. Uh, if for by default, what Maple will do is run the old approach, the traditional uh, approach that Maple had, and the new set approach in parallel, right? So then you have two cores working on the problem. It'll just return whichever one is first, right? So that way you kind of get the best of both worlds because the set approach is not always faster. Uh, you know, it was, it was hard to tell which one, you know, you, don't, you can't tell until you run it which one's going to be faster. Run them both, you get the best of both worlds, it'll just give you the result of whichever finishes first. So basically, they introduce you to the satisfy command, right? So not everyone knows Boolean logic, but uh, it's worthwhile, because often it's not too, some problems can be encoded into SAT fairly straightforwardly. So if that is the case, you know, give it a shot and you can often solve problems quicker than you could otherwise. So. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. So, questions? Yes? So the question is that why is the set solver faster? So the answer is no one actually has a truly rigorous understanding of why that is the case. Okay. This is ongoing research. The, the, the engineering answer is basically people have been competing for the fastest SAT solver for you know, decades. Okay. They have competitions where people try to, comp you know, research groups from around the world would compete to find the, we make the fastest SAT solver, there's medals. That, that puts a lot of engineering effort into making these things fast. As far as like a, a rigorous understanding of why they're fast, there's some, but not, nothing that 
we can really point to which is definitive. Uh, they are run deterministically, but they make random choices. Well, well they, they make, basically when you have a variable to, to assign true or false, it'll have to choose one or the other. It's a tree search. It's a, basically a tree search, but with a lot of bells and whistles. So these algorithms, they work very well on structured problems. All of these problems seem to me to work. Well. Yeah. If you take a random SAT problem, they perform the system uh, like any other uh, deep algorithm. But since uh, problems that, that come from, from applications often have a lot of structure, yeah, yeah. we solve it this way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, is the SAT solver in Maple uh, built in? Sorry? Where does the end time come from? Okay, yeah. So uh, the original logic package had uh, just a, it was kind of a naive SAT solver. And then I guess uh, Stephen uh, put in mini SAT a couple years ago, which was a SAT solver, which it's kind of, it's about a decade old now, but it's, it's used as a basis of a lot of SAT solvers. The one of, uh, I put in is called MapleSat, appropriately enough. Uh, it was developed at uh, Waterloo uh, by Vijay Ganesh's research group. And it, it won some uh, medals for the fastest SAT solver, I think, two years in a row. So, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the state of the art solvers. And it's built into Maple. It's written in uh, C. Yes. Anything else? Okay. Oh. Uh, so the question is, is it efficient? Yeah, oh, more efficient than. Uh, so yeah, the complexity is, uh, it's unknown, right? So it's uh, sad as an NP problem. It's NP complete. Nobody knows it can be if it can be solved faster than exponential time. So this is just, yeah, it, in practical applications which have a lot of structure, uh, it, they could, it could, it's a better than exponential, but there's no rigorous bounds on that. Well, you just take some experiment. From, yeah, experimental. Can you define some classes of examples where, where you know it's uh, not going to be yeah. Certain types of structured problems you could solve in polynomial time. Certain types you can't. Uh, so there's actually really easy problems that SAT solvers are known to perform in exponential time, even though it's in, even though it's easy. So there are some uh, results. It depends on the, the structure of the problem. All right, well, thank you, and let's get uh, coffee. <laughs>